All right. So we talked last time about photosynthesis and how we get carbohydrates and oxygen from sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide, right? So the plants take the carbon dioxide and water using sunlight energy, and they capture that energy in the form of a carbohydrate. And they can also use that carbohydrate, which is sucrose. They can turn that into fatty acids, right, glycerol and protein, and we can get all those good things that we get out of plants, like plants, peanuts, right? Peanuts contain protein that's made by the plant. We can get healthy fats out of plants, like avocados, right, that were made by the avocado plant. And then we get all the, the starch, which we can get out of potatoes that were made by the plant. So that process we call photosynthesis. So now we're going to talk about the next process, which is using those carbohydrates to make ATP. Because the goal to fuel our cells is not glucose or amino acids or fatty acids. We need to use those things to make this fuel currency of the cells, which is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. That's what our cells actually use. So if you think about our cells like a vehicle, like a car, our cars to go, we need money to buy gas, right? But it's the gas that actually fuels our vehicle. I can stuff dollar bills in the gas tank. It's not going to take me anywhere. That's how it is with our cells. Our cells don't use glucose for energy. They use glucose to make ATP, and ATP is what fuels our cells. So ATP is a special molecule that has an extra phosphate on it that we remove the phosphate and add it to a cellular protein, which gives that cell energy. So when we phosphorylate, it just means we're taking a phosphate off of ATP, because ATP, again, stands for adenosine triphosphate. Tri means how many? Three. So we have three phosphates. So this is adenosine diphosphate. This has two phosphates. So when we add a phosphate to adenosine diphosphate, we get adenosine triphosphate. So this process of adding a phosphate onto ADP, which is formed when we use energy, happens most efficiently in the mitochondria. So photosynthesis happens in what organelle? Chloroplasts. So plant cells have chloroplasts for photosynthesis. They also have mitochondria to then use those carbohydrates that they made in photosynthesis to grow and develop and store and do everything that they do. But animal cells don't have chloroplasts. We only have mitochondria. So we need to bring our energy in from an outside source. That's what makes us heterotrophs. Plants are autotrophs. Animal cells are heterotrophs, which means we need to get our sources of energy from a different source, not within our cells. We don't make our own energy like a plant does. So oxygen and glucose comes from plants, and then we use that oxygen and glucose to produce carbon dioxide and water, which the plants use to undergo photosynthesis. So it's this great you know, uh, interdependent cycle of photosynthesis and cellular respiration. One reaction provides the, pro the reactants for the next reaction. So we're focusing on the mitochondria. And we talked about oxidation reduction reactions, right? So here, we're taking glucose, and we're removing hydrogens. So that is an oxidation reaction. So when we remove hydrogens, and we call those electrons, right? Because hydrogen has one proton, one electron. When we remove those hydrogens, we call that oxidation. And we're taking this glucose and breaking it down into carbon dioxide. And then oxygen receives some of those hydrogens in the form of electrons, negatively charged electrons, to form water. So the glucose is converted to carbon dioxide, and the oxygen accepts electrons from hydrogen to form water. And then we get all this energy, which is ATP. So make sure you write that above there, that the energy we're talking about here is ATP. But we also get a little bit of energy that's also lost as heat. 
So when you come into a crowded room that's full of people just sitting there, they're not really exercising and creating a really warm environment, it's still going to heat up because we're always giving off heat to the environment, waste heat, just like the exhaust in your car is really hot, right? And we can't use that energy that's lost in our exhaust. So we lose a good amount of this energy in glucose to waste heat. But some of it is converted to ATP. About 35% is converted to actual energy in ATP. A majority is lost as heat. But that's about as efficient as most of our engines are, so it's not a terrible thing. So ATP is the energy, and then heat is just waste heat. And that's our body heat. That's why you can go outside and not freeze, because you're constantly metabolizing, you're constantly producing this waste heat. So uh, glucose is oxidized, again, removing hydrogens, losing electrons, and oxygen is reduced, which means it is gaining electrons and energized. So we have these coenzymes here that we've seen before. NAD plus comes from niacin in our diet. So you know in your vitamins, you look on the back side of your label of your vitamins, you'll see niacin, thiamine, you know, a lot of different um, important minerals and coenzymes that we need for metabolism. And a healthy diet provides those things. So when you are feeling good and your metabolism is, is going well, it usually reflects a healthy diet. Um, I know myself, when I eat a lot of junky food, like when we're on vacation and I'm eating donuts and um, pizza and things that aren't really high in a lot of those vitamins and minerals and coenzymes that support metabolism, I know I feel kind of lethargic and in, you, know, you feel achy in the morning, maybe you get headaches. All of that is related to empty calories. When you talk about our diet and having empty calories, it's like a donut. What's in that donut other than fat and simple sugars? Nothing, right? There's not vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin, the B vitamins, iron. All those things we need for really efficient metabolism are not in those foods. So when you look at you know, your diet, if you're not feeling energized, you feel like you're eating, you know, going from mac and cheese to breads to bagels, you know, those kind of empty carbs, you're not fueling metabolism, really giving yourself good energy. And, and I am a junk food junkie to the core. I mean, I could polish off a bag of Doritos in front of the computer very easily. And I love Coca-Cola and Mountain Dew and all that stuff. And I can tell you, when I eat healthy, when I've decided, okay, that's it, I'm going to reset my metabolism, I'm going to eat vegan and high protein, healthy fats from plants, I feel amazing. I mean, I feel on fire. My brain feels really clear. I have a lot of energy. It's amazing what it does, but it takes work. You gotta buy those foods, they gotta be ready, they gotta be there when you're hungry, because when you're hungry, what's easy to grab? The quick trip burgers and pizza and you know all those feel good foods, especially if you're tired or stressed out. You know, we wanna go toward those comfort foods, but what really fuels metabolism are those things that are part of this cellular respiration pathway. So NAD plus comes from niacin, and FAD comes from riboflavin. Have you heard of riboflavin? Maybe looking in your you know, vitamins or even in your healthy foods, we find these things. So these are gonna provide the electrons. They're gonna pick up electrons and dump off electrons, just like we saw in photosynthesis. What were the key players in photosynthesis? You remember? What was the coenzyme in photosynthesis we focused on? Take a look back in your notes if you don't remember. What was the enzyme? What was the electron carrier? Look back on page 69 of your notes. Yeah, we had NAD plus as well as NADP plus and FAD plus. But we focused a lot when we looked in the light reactions. Remember what the light reactions produced? and gave to the Calvin cycle? That was the NAD, NADPH, remember that? That was part of the Calvin cycle on the bottom of page 69. 
NADPH and ATP, so we picked up electrons and then brought them over to the electron transport chain, which uses those electrons to drive those proteins in the membrane, to f which then also drove hydrogen ions out of the membrane to fuel the ATP synthase pump, right? So we're going to see a similar process happening in the mitochondria. So when we look at cellular respiration, there's four major phases. Glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm, so that's a key concept in the cytoplasm of the cell. The citric acid cycle happens in the matrix of the mitochondria. So the citric acid cycle is like the Calvin cycle that occurs in the fluid of the mitochondria. I was jumping ahead of myself. So glycolysis is in the cytoplasm of the cell. Citric acid cycle happens in the fluid part of the mitochondria, and then the electron transport chain happens in the membrane of the mitochondria. And what do we call the membrane of the mitochondria? I think I have a picture of it right here. The membrane of the mitochondria is called the cristae. It's called the cristae. And what do we call the fluid part of the chloroplast? Do you remember? The stroma. The stroma. The fluid part of the mitochondria is called the matrix. So if you want to label that, just to make sure you know these parts, because this is also part of your quiz. So the fluid part of the mitochondria is called the matrix. And then the membrane is called the cristae. And that is spelled C R I S T A E. Cristae. So that's the membrane just like the stroma and the thylakoid membrane, or the thylakoid, yeah, thylakoid membrane of the chloroplast. So going back to our steps then, this occurs again in the cytoplasm of the cell. The citric acid occurs in the mitochondrial matrix, and this occurs in the mitochondrial membrane, which we said was the cristae. So I would Make sure that you recognize that that's the cristae. I'm going to make this not so thick. Cristae. Okay. So glucose enters, let's talk about the human body, just because that's what we're most familiar with. We each have one. So we bring in our, our glucose by eating a carrot. And our digestive system breaks down the starch in that carrot, releases glucose into our blood, and we have this glucose floating around in our blood. It diffuses out of our blood, enters our cell, and once it hits the inside of the cell, the enzymes for glycolysis are present in the cytoplasm to begin that breakdown. So glycolysis occurs outside the mitochondria. It occurs in the cytoplasm, and there's enzymes there that are going to convert that glucose into something called pyruvic acid or pyruvate. So I'll highlight this, pyruvate. Another name for that is pyruvic acid. Pyruvate or pyruvic acid, you might see both. So we convert that into two molecules, so we get two of these for every glucose molecule. So we're splitting glycolysis, lysis means to split. So think of it as splitting glucose. <coughs> and the end result is two pyruvic acid molecules. So to do that, unfortunately, it takes two, I'm sorry, two ATP to split that glucose. 
but then in the process of making pyruvic acid, we make four ATP in the process. But we had, do you ever hear the term, you gotta spend money to make money, right? Like when you're owning a business or starting a business, you gotta get a big loan to start the business and then hopefully the business makes profit and then you start to make money. Same thing here, this is called the energy investment step. So the investment step is because we're using two ATP. So that's why it's called the energy investment stage. And then we have the energy harvesting, harvesting stage because we're making four ATP. But what do we get at the end? The net, we get two ATP and two pyruvic acid molecules. So four ATP are produced, two were consumed to start the process, so we get a total of two ATP at the end. That's not a lot of energy, actually. So we said the energy in, in ATP is like a fuel for ourselves. Two ATP for one glucose molecule, that's really not enough to fuel ourselves and, and help us really get around our day. So this has to continue on to get a lot more ATP. So this is just the first step. So the next step then, so we have glucose, this coenzyme NAD+, we get two ATP going into, this, into glycolysis. When we're done with glycolysis, we get pyruvate. We picked up some electrons here in the form of NADH, and we have four ATP. The net gain is two. So at the end of glycolysis, we have two pyruvic acid molecules and two ATP. Now, if there's no oxygen available, what happens is you get the glucose, you get the pyruvic acid, but it's converted to lactate in animal cells. So in liver and muscle cells, that's converted to lactic acid. Or if we're in a yeast cell, it's converted to alcohol and carbon dioxide. So yeast cells can use glucose, if there's no oxygen available, it can use that glucose to form carbon dioxide and alcohol. And again, they get a little ATP in this process of glycolysis. So the benefit for us is we use yeast to get the carbon dioxide and the alcohol. So for example, when we make our bread, don't we use yeast when we make bread? And what happens to the alcohol? It's burned off. What remains, the carbon dioxide, is what makes the holes in your bread, right? When you look at, when you look at bread, it's a big ball of solid, you know, dough, right? And then when you cook it, it, the alcohol is released, goes into the air, and the, and the bubbles you see, the holes, are from that carbon dioxide that's given off. What about making beer or wine? We keep the alcohol in the beer or wine, right? You have to throw yeast in with your grapes and wine, so the, the grapes provide what for this process? What do they provide though? What, what reactant do they provide for fermentation? The sugar, yep, so they provide the sugar. As a result of that, they take the sugar from the grapes and they create alcohol and carbon dioxide. So do we, do we have bubbly wines? We do. Do we have wines with no bubbles? Yes, we have to release the carbon dioxide, right, during the process of making wine. But in beer, we keep the carbon dioxide, right? We like that bubbly, you know, some beers have more carbon dioxide than others, right? And what do we add to our alcohols? It depends what we're looking for, right? We provide some grain. If it's not wine, we provide some grain, right? We provide wheat or rice or barley. That provides the sugar. And then the yeast, we gotta throw yeast in there, that is going to take it and provide the alcohol and the carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide either stays or goes depending on what type of alcohol we're making. Question? More alcohol, yeah, it just depends how much you provide of water, right, because you gotta add fluid, you gotta add a liquid, a, sol a solvent in there for this whole process to occur in, yeah. So if we want more concentrated alcohols, then we have less water in there, right? So that's where you get the different proofs and percentages of alcohol, yeah. So we can take um, bacteria and do the same thing, have this fermentation process happen, and then what are you gonna produce? You're gonna produce 
lactate, you're going to produce lactic acid, right? So we don't want that. We want the alcohol and the carbon dioxide, and we add a little bit of sugar in there. So we have sweet wines and dry wines, right, depending on how much alcohol and, and sugar we want remaining in our alcohol when we're done. So we have lots of different food products that are made by fermentation. Have you heard of kombucha? 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 Everybody says it a little different. That's like a fermented beverage. Um, it's really good for us. Um, we have bacteria um, in yogurt that ha can create fermented products that we use. That's something that goes into kombucha, actually. Kimchi is something that we use. It's a fermented product. Um, gives off a lot of carbon dioxide. When you open up a bottle of kimchi, you better open up over the sink because it's going to bubble over into your sink, and it really stinks. It's a good kid repellent. If you want to clear kids out of the kitchen really fast, just open up a can of, or a bottle of kombucha or not, um, kimchi, it really smells. It's a fermented cabbage, actually. They do it in Korea. They bury it under the ground and let it rot for a period of time, and they add a bunch of spices to it. And it's really good, actually. I like it. It's very spicy, very tasty, good texture to it. Um, oh, yeah, that sounds good. Mm-hmm, yeah, yeah. It's a tasty treat. So it's good for gut health, too. It has lots of healthy bacteria in it. That's what's producing um, the, 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 that's what's undergoing fermentation. So we have healthy bacteria in there, and it's good for the gut. It pro provides healthy bacteria for our gut that can sometimes get overridden by bad bacteria from high preservative, high fat, high carb diets. We can get um, some bad bacteria kind of colonizing our gut, leading to uh, gas, people that are passing gas all the time, and constipation, that's oftentimes a result of bad gut bacteria, and you can replace that with good bacteria from these fermented products that we create. Soy sauce is another fermented product. Um, what else? The, the drinkable yogurt, kefir, if you've ever heard of that, that has a lot of really good bacteria in it that undergo this fermentation process. So if there's no, not enough oxygen available, cells will switch over to fermentation and they're gonna take the, the, the glucose, make pyruvic acid with glycolysis because glycolysis does not need oxygen, and then it's gonna turn that into lactic acid or if it's a yeast cell, so only yeast can turn it into alcohol and carbon dioxide. So we can't turn it into alcohol. We'd be drunk, right, if we didn't get enough oxygen and we were going into uh, alcoholic fermentation. We don't do that. We create lactic acid. And you know that burn you feel, right, if you ever have to run up the steps or you're running to class, right, or you're carrying something, groceries in that are really heavy, and all of a sudden you feel a burn in your muscles. That's because you're creating a lot of energy and your cells are trying to keep up, and they can't because there's not enough oxygen available, so they're switching into this lactic acid fermentation, and that's that burn you feel. And then, like everybody feels, when you're done with a, an activity that created lactic acid, you're breathing heavily, and that's a result of bringing extra oxygen to convert that lactic acid back to glucose or to turning it into ATP. It's a way of our body recovering and going down the right path to make lots of ATP. But whenever we're undergoing short bursts of, of activity, we're always going to produce lactic acid because it takes time for us to go through the next steps. It takes time for those enzymes to enter into the picture and be used and go through this process of making lots of ATP. So we just get a little bit of ATP with fermentation, but we're going to get lots of ATP when you go to the next steps. So we talked about these. These are just examples of things that we use um, with the help of fermentation. So lots of good things that we use for that. Yogurts, breads, wines, cheeses. So the good part, it provides quick energy for muscular activity. It's good for short, intense bursts. But again, you're going to feel the burn, and you're going to tire out really fast. So if we... Um, have a blood clot in an artery serving the heart muscle, heart muscle cells don't do well in this lactic acid fermentation pathway, and we're going to feel short of breath, and we're going to feel a pressure or a burning sensation in the chest, and that's called angina or chest pain. That's a sign of a heart attack, and that means that there's poor blood supply to the heart muscle, and it's 
not able to pump effectively without enough oxygen and ATP eventually. So as a result, we need to fix that right away. So anybody with chest pain or pressure, we don't drive them to the hospital, we call the ambulance, because the ambulance can be there sometimes in, within 10 minutes, and they have medicines to give people right there to help clear that or improve the oxygenation to the heart. So we want to give that to people right away. Same thing with stroke symptoms. You don't say, oh, I'll let me drive you to the hospital. No, you call an ambulance and they can give you things right there in your home to, to clear that clot or to help dissolve that clot. There have, and I know somebody actually that this happened to a relative. There are many cases of people that are dead in the ER parking lots because they drove themselves to the hospital and didn't make it into the doors and were dead in their cars. So I'm telling you that because you're all young and throughout your lives you might come across this. So a relative, friend is talking about chest pain or feeling short of breath or showing signs of stroke. Call an ambulance and get them seen. Unless you're across the street from the hospital then and you can take them, fine. But time is heart muscle. We tell our patients don't wait because um, our cells cannot live without oxygen. All right, so um, yeast will then die from the alcohol they produce because that creates a harsh environment for them. So that's fine, though, because we get what we want out of them, right? We get the alcohol, we get the carbon dioxide, depending on what it is. So um, when we look at you know, fermentation, we don't get a lot of energy out of that. We only get 14.6 kilocals of energy, but if we have oxygen, we can get 686. So we only get two ATP out of fermentation. If we go into the mitochondria and we have lots of oxygen available with good breathing, which everybody has right now, we can get 36 to 38 molecules of ATP for one glucose. So it's really ideal to have oxygen available, and we all do have oxygen available. So these are the parts of the mitochondria that we already labeled. The cristae is the membrane. The matrix is the fluid. So in the cristae is where the Krebs cycle, or we also call it the citric acid cycle occurs, and in the matrix is where, oops, I said that wrong. The cristae is where the electron transport chain happens, and the matrix is where the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle occurs, so the fluid part. All right, so the prep reaction is where pyruvic acid from glycolysis is converted into acetyl coenzyme A. And then we begin the process of the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. So if we form, we need to take the acetyl coenzyme A. And now there's a lot of steps along the way of the Krebs cycle. All I want you to know is what is formed in the process of entering into the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. So what happens is we remove hydrogens as we take this acetyl coenzyme A and we add carbon to it. We start, as it goes through the cycle, we remove hydrogens. And at the end, we removed all the hydrogens off of that six carbon molecule that we start with, and we're left with carbon dioxide. And that's a waste gas, right? So that's gone, that we exhale that out. And as a result, we get two more ATP, and a lot of these energy-rich coenzymes, NADH and FADH2. So we get six of these, six NADH and two FADH2 as we send one glucose, well, there's two pyruvic acids, right, for one glucose, so the Krebs cycle has to run twice. Because you have glucose, it splits into two pyruvic acid, each pyruvic acid goes around, so we end up with this per glucose. So again, I'm just going to make a little note here, this is a waste product, it's not used We exhale that.
But when carbon dioxide combines with water, it forms carbonic acid, and that does play a nice role in pH of our blood. So we need a little bit of carbon dioxide in our blood, which we always will have because we're always undergoing metabolism. But excess carbon dioxide is given off in our exhale. And that's good, right, because the plants use it. So every living cell that needs glucose to grow and survive and whatever is always releasing carbon dioxide to the environment. So there is no shortage. Unfortunately, we have an excess of carbon dioxide and other carbon, like carbon monoxide, right, that's given off into the environment and that's contributing to the greenhouse effect. So when we burn fuels, we're giving off carbon gases, carbon containing gases into the environment and that contributes to the greenhouse effect, trapping of heat near the Earth's surface and global warming, right? So we gotta really be careful how much we're burning and that's when you look at, you now, you know, being a consumer in today's society, you gotta think about, you know, what are the products you're using? Are you creating a lot of garbage? Well, where does this garbage go? Garbage goes to landfills or it gets burned. Either way, we're using up land space, right? So we have to be smart about the garbage that we use. Um, we gotta be smart about the packaging that we buy things and like my kids always ask for, you know, the little packaged treats and I look at all the plastic that that's generating, like a little, like the little Sunny D, little Sunny Delights, little tiny, you know, bottles or whatever, you know, they love those. And the kids at school had those in their lunches and oh, I want that. Oh no, you know, we'll buy you a metal container and you can fill it with some Sunny D and take it to school that way. Or water bottles, you know, my daughter likes to drink water throughout the day. You know, giving her a, a container that she's gonna reuse is better than little plastic water bottles all day long. So you gotta think about the garbage that we use. Same thing we've we already talked about. When you go to Quick Trip, you don't get a bag for two items, right? Just put it in your hand, carry it to your car. Especially if it's something you're gonna eat right away, do you need that plastic bag for something you're gonna take it out and throw it away in 10 minutes after you walk out the door? Sometimes we even throw the bag away as we're walking out of the store, right? What a waste of plastic. Target, I think, has recyclable containers for extra plastic bags. Great place to go with your plastic because to throw those in the garbage is just creating more carbon dioxide waste as we burn those plastics or they end up in landfills and never go away. So what goes in, what comes out? So we have this NAD, FAD that's created and we get the two ATP, I'm sorry, these pick up electrons from breaking down that carbohydrate, right? And we get these nice NADH and FADH2 that are carrying electrons to the electron transport chain and we get two ATP. So we got two ATP in glycolysis, we get two ATP in the Krebs cycle. It's the electron transport chain that's gonna create lots more ATP that we need. So it's in the cristae of the mitochondria. We have these proteins embedded in the cristae. And if it's a bacteria, so this is important here, this is a question I think on the quiz. Bacteria do not have organelles. So how do they undergo energy production? So where are these? proteins, they're in the plasma membrane of bacteria. They don't have mitochondria, so these proteins for the electron transport chain are in the plasma membrane of the bacteria. So remember we have the nucleoid, so the proteins are just right here in the membrane. Okay, all right, so Here's our diagram, looks like the diagram on the bottom of your um, worksheet, it's in Blackboard. So we have, same thing, we have this NADH, FADH2, the electrons go down the transport chain and we are pumping hydrogen. So again, when we take a hydrogen off, the electron goes into the membrane and is used to pass down these protein carriers or protein embedded in the membrane and then we create this hydrogen accumulation that again is used to fuel our ATP synthase pump. So the hydrogen is pumped out of 
this inner membrane of the mitochondria and it builds up outside and acts as a fuel for the ATP synthase pump. And this chemical reaction we're not going to analyze. We just take for face value that the movement of hydrogen ion through this enzyme, this ATP synthase pump, adds a phosphate to ADP to make ATP. And we get lots, because we have lots of electron, our protons out here from these electron carriers, NADH and FADH2, lots of protons, provides a nice fuel to make lots of ATP. So we can get up to 32 ATP per glucose molecule in the electron transport chain. So if we look at, in the cytoplasm, we said you take glucose, you get two pyruvic acid molecules, we get a net of two ATP as a result of glycolysis, and this occurs in the cytoplasm. So this is a nice summary of these reactions. Then that pyruvate is converted to acetylcoenzyme A in the preparatory reaction, enters, and we get a little bit of carbon dioxide release from that process, and then it goes into the citric acid cycle where we continue to remove hydrogens from that six carbon molecule, reducing it, oxidizing it, I should say, oxidizing it to make carbon dioxide, remove all the hydrogens off of it to make carbon dioxide, and two more ATP. And then when it goes into the electron transport chain, all this NADH and FADH2 we created in glycolysis, the preparatory reaction, and the citric acid cycle carries that to those proteins in the membrane of the mitochondria to make lots of ATP. So at the end, we can get 32 to 34 ATP out of the electron transport chain. We got two and two here to make four here, so we can get a total of 36 to 38 ATP out of one glucose molecule. So we need all three of these working together, but which ones, which of these reactions that you see here glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, or the electron transport chain, which of those requires oxygen, did we say? The citric acid cycle and Yep, and the electron transport chain. Because look at what happens in the electron transport chain. Here's where the oxygen is directly used. Oxygen accepts extra electrons from hydrogen to form water. So oxygen is the final electron acceptor, and it forms water. And isn't that the other waste product of cellular respiration is water? In our exhale, we have water vapor and carbon dioxide. That's a result of metabolism of these processes occurring in our cells. So that's what's released to the blood, diffuses into our lungs, and is exhaled out of our lungs, is this carbon dioxide, or um, is this water vapor. So carbon dioxide is a waste product of the first set of reactions, and water is a waste product from the electron transport chain. So this is, the electron transport chain is what uses oxygen directly to form water. So where do we get glucose? We can get glucose from any of these sources. And you've heard of low carb or zero carb diets, right? <laughs> People can survive with no carbohydrate. That's because our cells, our liver is great in converting carbohydrates to, to protein, or converting proteins to, to carbohydrate or ketones. Have you heard of ketone or ketogenesis, the ketogenic diet, right? So these are efficient ways that our cells can convert non-carbohydrate foods to energy. But not everybody does well on those diets. Like if a person has liver disease, they probably are not going to do well on converting these nutrients from one to another, so it's not smart for people with liver disease to go on ketogenic diets. But um, some people do really well. Like they find that low carb diets reduce inflammation in the body. Um, some people go on zero carb diets that have seizures and it stops their seizures 100%. Um, some people go on ketogenic diets. Um, they find that the symptoms of autism significantly reduce 
on a ketogenic diet. So there's a lot to be said for um, carbohydrates not being um, the best fuel for some people with some of those medical conditions. Um, when we look at classifying reactions, catabolic reactions, catabolism means that we are breaking something bigger down into something smaller. So when we break down starch in our digestive tract and release the glucose molecules, we're breaking the bonds in that starch molecule. And whenever we break bonds of large molecules, we release energy to the environment. So the term exergonic, exer means exo, so we're releasing energy to the outside. So an exergonic reaction is going to release heat. And because that's a waste heat, right? Not these aren't always um, efficient that we release all the energy to make ATP. We're going to release heat. So exergonic reactions are going to release heat to the environment whenever we break things down. So when you put gas in your tank, those are long chains of gas of fuel like high octane fuel, right? We talk about that. So when we burn that in our engines, we release heat out of the exhaust pipe and the rest of the energy in those bonds of the gasoline are what drives our engines. So when the liver breaks down glycogen, it's releasing, releasing glucose to the blood. And then anabolism is when we're building molecules, building large molecules. So that consumes energy. We need energy to build things. So when we convert, when fat is converted to glucose, we're, con we're taking energy and using it. So anabolism is when we're taking and making bigger molecules. Have you heard of anabolic steroids before? That's when you, we're taking testosterone, anabolic steroids, bodybuilders will, ah, bodybuilders will um, take artificial testosterone to increase protein synthesis to get bigger muscles, right? So they take in, we call those steroids, which are just sex hormones in this case. There's different types of steroids, but testosterone is a type of steroid hormone. And they'll take that as an excess outside of what their body naturally produces, and it increases protein synthesis. They get more muscle as a result of that. But what happens when people take, when males take anabolic steroids, the brain senses all this testosterone in the blood that they're bringing in artificially, so that tells the testes to, re, to make less because there's plenty to go around. And as a result of that, the reproductive organs actually shrink because the testes aren't making any local testosterone to keep the reproductive system up and have sperm production. So fertility goes down in people that take artificial steroids, testosterone, and the size of the reproductive organs shrink. But the muscles get bigger, and that's what they're in for, right, because they're usually in competitions. So anabolic steroids is what I was going to write here. So catabolism breaks things down, anabolism builds things up. So anytime we're eating food, we're breaking it down, right? Digestion in our digestive tract with the help of all of our digestive enzymes is breaking things down. And then when we're building new things, we call that anabolism. So when I eat, say, a Snicker bar, I'm bringing in peanuts, right? So that's a protein. My body doesn't need peanut protein for anything. So I'm going to break that protein down into amino acids. It's going to enter my blood. And then my different cells are going to reassemble those amino acids to make a new protein that I do need. Like insulin is a protein. Hemoglobin is a protein. Collagen in our skin, in bone, in muscle, in ligaments, and tendons, those are proteins, and our body assembles those by anabolism. So we're taking energy and remaking new things by anabolism. And where do we get the energy to add and make these new things? Right. And, but specifically, what's the fuel? ATP. And where do we get that fuel from? Today's topic <laughs> is in the mitochondria, cellular respiration, right? So 
What's the point of all that? If I need to make protein, let's say I just had surgery, let's say I have a really bad illness and I need to make a lot of antibodies, which are proteins, what do I need to bring into my body for food? Protein containing things, right? Amino acids that when my body can bring in a peanut, turn it into, you know, break it down into amino acids and reassemble it to make antibodies or collagen to heal my broken bone or my burn or whatever. So a big mistake people make is, you know, they come on a surgery and as nurses we're like, okay, let's have something to eat. And maybe they're overweight. This is a big thing I see. We have an obese patient come in with a heart attack. They come in, oh, I'm not gonna eat, I don't have an appetite. And they're using it as an opportunity to lose weight really bad time to lose weight when you're recovering from major surgery. Not a time to focus on losing weight. You need to bring in calories and energy to recover from that surgery. So we need to bring in protein, because what do they want to eat? When, you, when your stomach is kind of eh, you're not feeling well, you want to eat like toast, right? Toast and maybe some fruit. But is that good for healing? Like if a person has multiple broken bones, they've just been in an accident, we need them to eat protein to heal. Well, it's important, again, you guys are going to be out in the community and being maybe it's going to happen to you or someone you know. you got to think about these things. Our metabolism needs the, the, the basic starters for what we're trying to build in ourselves if we're ill or injured. And again, just thinking about our diets, we need to have foods that create all these great things for metabolism. Metabolism runs well when it has... B vitamins and the coenzymes that we mentioned here, metabolism runs well on it. Vitamin D is another thing that we're really low on. 80% of Americans are low on vitamin D, especially in areas that have winter seasons where we're inside and we're not making vitamin D in the sunlight because your skin starts the process of making vitamin D when it's exposed to sunlight. But if we're not exposed to sunlight, we're not making vitamin D, and then people get seasonal affective disorder, which is, we say, sad, seasonal affective disorder. That's depression in the winter months because we're not out making vitamin D. So it's important to get sunshine or at least supplement vitamin D in your diet. A little bottle of vitamin D is really cheap at Walmart. It's like five bucks for a lot of little tiny, and they're really tiny little gel capsules, not even capsules, little... They're really smaller, round, cheap, easy to take in, and vitamin, our, every cell in the body has receptors for vitamin D. We know vitamin D is important for bone strength. It's important for um, immune function, and we know that it's linked to depression, that people ha that have chronic depression often have low vitamin D levels, but we don't test for vitamin D levels very good, very well. We're good here in the U.S. at throwing pills at symptoms, right? We don't look for what is the cause of these symptoms, we just throw pills at the symptoms. So we give people antidepressants. Oh, you're feeling anxious? Here's a pill. Feeling depressed? Here's a pill. You know, don't, don't think about, you know, other solutions, we just give pills. And some people need those medicines, right? If you have really low secretion of the feel-good hormones, like serotonin, some people need medicines to, to stay functional. But mild to moderate depression and anxiety can often be treated with proper diet and exercise. And that's something that we're not very good at here in the US is, is taking care of ourselves. So um, vitamin D is one of those things that a person can at least try or add to see if it helps them feel a little bit better. Okay, so putting these things together then, it's really important that you see this relationship because we need trees, we need algae in our waterways to provide what major thing for cellular respiration to keep us going? Oxygen. Oxygen, right? For all organisms to undergo cellular respiration, they need the oxygen that's produced by photosynthesis. So it all starts with light. The source of all energy on Earth starts with the sun. It's captured by photoautotrophs, they create the sugar, right? The, the carbon, the CH2O, they create the sugar, the base of the food chain, and then it goes up from there, and they provide the oxygen. Then we take the oxygen, turn it into water and carbon dioxide, which again goes into photosynthesis. So the chloroplasts and the mitochondria are really partners in this cycle of fuel 
right? Fuel usage and fuel production. So without the sun and without these chloroplasts, cellular respiration couldn't take place. And without the mitochondria, photosynthesis couldn't take place. So it's a good relationship, except for the fact that our factories and our emissions are producing lots and lots of carbon dioxide into the environment. And even, did you know that cow flatulence is another source of the greenhouse effect in global warming? We have these factory farms with thousands and thousands of car cows, and when they break down cellulose in their digestive tract, they release methane, which is in everybody's gas that they pass through their digestive tract. That methane is released into the air and contributes to the greenhouse effect. So lots and lots and lots of cows producing lots and lots of gas out their backsides is actually raising global temperatures. So we really have to be smart about what goes out of our exhaust pipe. We need to get fuel efficient cars and fuel efficient furnaces. Anything that's creating exhaust or heat to the environment, we really want to limit that. So one thing that we did in our home that we built is I put in a geothermal heating and air conditioning system. And a lot of people I talk to, a lot of the builders are like, ah, oh, that's no good. Oh, that's not, you don't need that. The truth is, is they don't know how it works. So they tell you that it doesn't, you know, they don't like that. But if you go to a professional who knows how to install it and knows how it works, it's an excellent source. Because what it does is the, the, the air below the ground is about 55 degrees year round. Even when it's 10 below outside, the air below the ground the groundwater is about 55 degrees. So what geothermal systems do is they take that temperature water, they bring it into your home, and if you want your home to be, say, 65, 70, let's say 70, I only have to heat that air from 55 to 70. If you have a regular furnace, you're taking outside air that's 10 below and heating it to 70. You think it'd take more energy to go from 10 below to 70 versus 55 to 70? big difference. Same thing when it's really hot outside. When it's 90 outside, I have to cool it to 70. That's a 20 degree difference. If it's 100 and whatever outside and I need to cool it to 70, I'm running a lot more energy. So geothermal systems, good insulation on your homes, those are all really important things we can do to protect our environment and not be contributing, contributing to the heat that we're producing into the atmosphere. All right, so we'll stop at this point and pick up with our next topic.